But look, I've got one o'clock on my watch. Um, I reckon we might get this show on the road. Um, I might uh, start off by just thanking everyone for attending. Um, we've, I've been blown away actually how much interest this uh, webinar has got. We've got over 187 registered. Uh, whether uh, that many will turn up, probably not, uh, but I can see there's at least 71 participants already. Um, so thank you all very much for your time and we will try and keep it short and sweet and give plenty of opportunity for questions. If you do have questions, uh, and we've actually had one at least uh, provided in an email, um, uh, prior to the uh, session. Uh, but if you've got Q uh, questions you want to ask myself or Michael, uh, please put them in the Q&A uh, forum. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom nowadays, but um, yeah, please put your questions uh, in that and we'll try to address each of them. We will try and get this uh, wrapped up um, probably at around about 1.45 at the latest. Uh, so probably 20 minutes of presentation time and uh, followed by a whole bunch of Q&A. Uh, but without further ado, look, I'm, I'm uh, helping Michael present today. I'm a, a principal environmental engineer at Ocean Protect, uh, and I've been with these crazy cats for about a year and a half. Uh, but well before my time, Michael Wicks was uh, co-founded uh, OSHA Protect with his uh, business partner, uh, Jeremy Brown, uh, who's I'm sure tuning in from New Zealand as we speak. Uh, and Michael's got a whole bunch of experience. Uh, like uh, he's been uh, doing OSHA Protect slash Stormwater 360 stuff for a long time. I think he what, founded the, the company 14 years ago. Um, and it's has been, uh, years now, Brad. what's that? Years. 19, 19 years. years. I should, sorry. Uh, but, uh, and it's obviously, look, this guy, and I, I'll, I'll say this obviously, I'm biased because I, he's my boss, but he knows a lot about storm retrieval monitoring. Uh, not much about anything else, but uh, he knows a lot about uh, <laughs> storm retrieval monitoring. Uh, and there's that these guys have done a lot of really cool research uh, at this um, particular site in Western Sydney. So look, um, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna start off by essentially describing what is high flow bioretention system. So what is, high, what is a high flow rate bioretention or biofiltration as we use the term. Essentially, in short, that little tree uh, you can see there uh, on the left hand side of the screen, that is a high flow bioretention system. That is a tree pit system um, that essentially treats stormwater, just like a conventional bioretention system. So water comes through a little cutout in the curb there um, and enters the uh, filter and plant uh, environment where that tree sits. And essentially water percolates through the filter media and through the, the roots and the, and the mulch, et cetera. And water is collected in outer drainage and then discharged downstream, just like a conventional bioretention system. Um, and this is essentially a cross section of, of, a, of, a, of what we would uh, call a high flow rate uh, system. We also use the term Filterra uh, bioretention system. The reason being is because the key difference between conventional uh, bioretention systems, which will use a sandy loam media, and the high flow systems is the filter media. Instead of sandy loam, uh, which might drain at 200 millimeters an hour roughly, um, we use a, what we call Filterra, an engineered high flow rate uh, media. Now there's a couple of other sort of minor differences. Uh, the Filterra bioretention systems also have a, a depth of mulch, a 75 millimeter depth of uh, double shredded hardwood mulch, which is critically important for two things. Number one, helps retain moisture within the filter media. So plants and other sort of biological um, critters can grow and, and, and thrive. Um, and, and that also provides a, essentially a, a, tr a pre-treatment function, like a gross pollutant trap. So removing a whole bunch of coarse sediment, et cetera. And if anyone who attended the uh, presentation with uh, Ralph Leiderer, hosted by Stormwater Victoria in Queensland just last week, mm -hmm. that sediment deposition issue is a key uh, dilemma for a lot of bioretention systems. So we really go and mitigate that potential risk of blinding, uh, through the use of that um, mulch layer. We, we do have a little bit of storage on top, just like a conventional bioretention system. We don't need, an, we don't need a drainage layer um, between the filter media and the drainage layer, but yeah, we do have a drainage layer and then you've obviously got the dr uh, under drainage pipes as well. So that is a typical cross-section of a, of a Filterra bioretention system. So fairly similar to a conventional bioretention system with a few little minor tweaks. Um, and look, here are some other examples. That little tree pit on the left-hand side is a Filterra bioretention system. So the pit to the right is just an overflow pit. So water will come in through that curb cutout and uh, flow through that Filterra uh, bioretention system to get treated. If the flows are too high, it'll uh, overflow and go into the um, adjacent uh, pit there. 
Uh, there's a, there's another example. This is a, a system that was been in the ground for probably a couple of years out at Warwick farm. Uh, and there's a whole, obviously you can see from the pictures, there's a real diverse mix of, uh, tree and plant species there. And this is a, another, uh, Filtera bioretention system out at Warwick farm. Look, uh, you, you obviously can see the concrete walls around it. That's not a feature that, uh, is essential. That was actually the client's preference. Um, you, our preference is definitely to have gradually sloping batters, but yeah, the key thing here is, um, that's been in the ground for a couple of years and uh, the plants are growing well. It seems to be working quite well. Yeah, uh, that, I think that's, yeah. sorry, bro. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, we planted that system out in, in December, 2017, um, in the middle of a drought. Um, we had no die off of the plants and that's due to really the fact that the mulch layer is there. It provides a lot of support, especially when the plants are getting going, but also, Afterwards, when you have those long, prolonged dry periods, they can really support um, holding the moisture in the soil. You know, because we're draining so fast, the, the, the media tends to dry out, but the mulch stops that from occurring. So it's a really, really important point. And you can see there, some of those trees in the back there are getting quite large. So the system's only, we're three years old in, in December this year. So it's going along quite nicely. Yeah, and one of the things, a couple of, this is what we call a bioscape uh, or a bioretention basin. It's it's a little bit different to a conventional bioretention system. We do have a, a, a coarse sediment four bay in this system, and you can see just these little uh, bubble up pipes. So basically, this is how water or stormwater flows come into the Filtera bioretention system for our bigger system. Again, to achieve a more I guess, even distribution of flow across the media, which to be honest, we often see that in bigger conventional bio systems in that uh, you might have a whole bunch of water falling out at the start of the system, but the, uh, the plants at the end don't get much water, so really struggle. Whereas we're really trying to uh, achieve a, an even flow distribution. You can see with the, uh, the biggest systems here, sorry for um, Warwick Farm, we have split the system into two cells. Do you want to explain the reason for that, Michael? Yeah, look, the... Um you know, and Brad just touched on it before, distributing flow and Filtera is probably one of our biggest challenges. You know, we need to get the water in and get the water out across the area. Remember, we're running at 3,500 millimetres an hour, um, and the system will go up to five to 6,000 millimetres per hour in some events as well. So the water does drain through extremely quickly. Um, that's why we have a, a shallower a ponding or extended tension depth as well. So we compartmentalize each system, put into cells of maximum 90 square meters. So we can get good control and spreading the water going in, but also get the water out as well. So we split them into cells. We typically line each cell, stop the migration of soil on the outside, and you have good control on each portion of the Filtera basin. So yeah, sure, you can have basins that are five, six, seven hundred square meters in the a, pre, a couple of previous slides, I think that system's about 600 square metres and you just divide them into those segments. Um, and yeah, you have much better control um, over your overall system hydraulics in and out. And you know, because again, you, you, you need to wet the entire system, not just a portion. You want to spread that flow as best you can because if you don't, you really get excessive loading in, in, in the mulch in certain areas, which will lead to weed growth. Um, or you won't get enough moisture distributed throughout the system, you get plant die-off. So it's very important to manage those aspects of each system. Cool. Um, look, we do have uh, some other examples as well. Um, this is another bigger system uh, out at Silverdale. This has recently been constructed. You can probably see the, the bubble up points uh, a bit more clearer there. These are were literally constructed, I think, last week uh, out at Caloundra. Um, this is a, a Filtera bioretention system literally brand new, uh, week, week old, I guess. Uh, and there's uh, a, a few of these, uh, sorry, a couple of these. So this is a, another one. You can see this is a very constrained environment. And as a comparison, like one thing we should point out is that our Filtera biosystems are sized at roughly 0.3% of the upstream catchment. So often three or four or five times smaller than a conventional bioretention system. So the original uh, plan for this site was conventional bio, but they would have really struggled to fit this in. You know, it's right up against a, a building, a retaining wall, a fire hydrant, and then as, as a road, meter to the left so they would have really struggled to fit this in whereas because we can make this much smaller uh we can i guess more appropriately integrate it into the um in this case a fairly confined um commercial uh environment now this is a little bit different um this is a, a real doozy of mine i love this project this is actually that you can see here this planter box here that's a, a tree in there and then there's a whole bunch of carex suppressor we actually 
took out uh, uh, the vegetation and soil that was in this original planter box and essentially turned this area, this little two, uh, two planter boxes into a Filtera bioretention system. Now, stormwater doesn't go into this system. What goes into it is actually lake water. So we actually pump uh, two nights a week, uh, nine hours at a time each time, so 18 hours a week, and we pump water from the lake into this system. And we, we've been, uh, this was installed in April last year. So it's been in the ground for what, um, 17 months or so. And we've, there's a lot of water going through this system uh, and it seems to be hydraulically uh, handling that, that flow. And obviously the plants are uh, growing quite well. Uh, and uh, yeah, look, uh, I, I see a lot of potential for sort of the, I guess these systems to be used in treating recirculated lake water in particular. But this is just a trial. Uh, we're gonna look at this a little bit further in the next um, year or so. Um, but look, how is Filtera uh, or high flow bioretention system any different to conventional bio systems? Two things. Uh, number one, yeah, the high flow systems, as you might imagine, treat uh, stormwater flow or water at a much higher flow rate. A conventional sandy lamb system might treat water at, say, 100 to 300 millimetres an hour. The guidelines might say, yeah, 200 millimetres an hour. Our design hydraulic conductivity for Filterra systems is three and a half metres an hour. Now, that's probably conservative, as Michael indicated. We're, we're generally seeing rates for around four and a half to five metres an hour. So we can essentially treat water at a much higher flow rate. As a result, Filterra systems are smaller than conventional biosystems. So again, we size our systems at 0.3% at of the upstream catchment. Again, much smaller than a conventional bio. But the other key difference is the, the process of delivery. Um, you might imagine for a conventional biosystems, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You have a, it might be a consultant doing the, the conceptual design and potentially another one doing the detailed design. You've got a civil contractor, landscape contractor, and then ultimately an asset manager. You only need sort of one person to sort of make a mistake or drop, their, drop the ball and the system can have operational issues. Our preference is to essentially be involved in the whole thing. Uh, so to essentially uh, ensure that the end result is actually what the original design objective, uh, the, the, essentially the end result achieves the original design intent. Uh, our preference is to actually manage our, these assets uh, ourselves. So obviously if we wanna manage or own these assets, um, we wanna make sure it's done properly. So we are, are very much wanting to be involved in every step of the process. We're not just rocking up with a truck and, and throwing some uh, dirt uh, filter media in the ground, we want to make sure that these, these systems are, are working as intended. The other key difference is, or sorry, what, what, one key aspect of this is the, the, the makeup of the filter media. You know, I think it's a real leap of faith that you, the, the filter media, the bioretention sand you might get from a supplier uh, is actually in accordance with its original specification. You know, often these specifications are six or 12 months old. In the, the development, or making of uh, Filterra, it's a very tightly controlled process. There's about 25 individual QA and QC steps to essentially ensure that the specification is achieved. Uh, there's no, no one does anything like that uh, for filter meter in Australia. And I think it's potentially a key reason why we are seeing some systems really struggle. Yeah, I think to that, to that point, Brad, it's, you know, there's, you know, there's no magic about, you know, what is, Terror and high flow bio and why does it work? You need the control. You know, if, if, you, if you're going to run it, you know, 3,500 to sort of 5,000 millimetres per hour and get the same, if not better performance than standard bioretention running at 120th of the flow rate, you need to have good quality control on your media and your delivery process. There's so many things, as you know, that can go wrong and there's so many cooks in the kitchen, as you said, that... You know, it's not just building it, it's also making the media. And to get, you know, one test report or certificate for media per thousand tonnes is just really not good enough. Um, you know, sure, if you're going to run at 200 millimetres now, that might be okay. But if you want that smaller footprint around that 0.3% and you want the performance, you really have to do a lot more work in the back end to achieve that over the long term. Mm. Well, let's talk about the performance now. So... There are, this is, this is a technology or, or an innovation that's been in the States for about 20 years. There's probably about 9,000 of these systems already installed and operating in the USA. And there's, there's monitoring sites. So one of them being in North Carolina, um, uh, a tree pit system collected uh, results from 34 storms over nearly two years and achieved um, good uh, treatment uh, results as well. 
Um, so th this is actually fairly similar to the one we actually have at Western Sydney. Another one is out at Washington State. Again, uh, a bunch of storms, 12 storms over a seven month period. And again, just focusing on TSS and TP, good removals of those pollutants um, as well. But obviously everyone thinks rain falls differently in Australia um, and there is a need for local testing. Um, so back in the day, Michael and the crew realized this and, and went about trying to identify some suitable sites. Um, did you want to talk to this, Michael? Yeah, look, yeah, why not? Um, you know, it, when, when you go out and do a field study, you don't just roll up on site and set the gear up. You really need to plan out the process thoroughly before you even start. Um, so effectively, we use a lot of little manual sample bottles to, to sort of pre-qualify a site before we jump in. So we, we started with about 12 sites, and obviously you need access, location's important, um, you know, proximity to the coast and, and, and rainfall patterns, all these things need to be taken in consideration because um, you want to have that good build up and wash off of pollutants. Um, if the sites are too clean, you get null outcomes. If the sites are too dirty, um, again, you know, it's not representative of the performance of the system on a typical or, or average site. So you set these manual sample bottles up like we did. Um, we then go through and collect a heap of data for about um, six storms. And we whittled basically 12 sites down to two. Um, and, and that's effectively what happens. You, you either poor hydraulics or um, uh, poor pollutant load um, basically, you know, discredits or discounts a lot of the different sites. Because um, you really want to settle this gear up with, with the intent for success. You don't want to sit there and waste your time, your effort, your energy, um, in setting it up. Sure, you can use all the gear from site to site, but you waste so much time um, by just, you know, getting no outcomes from poor sites. So we went from 12 sites to one, and, and that was the one here at, um, at Western Sydney. It's a, it's a small little catchment, um, about 400 square metres, but a good little car park with some good build-up and wash-up pollutants and a good mix of soluble versus particulate for nitrogen as well. Um, and, you know, once you pre qual the site, you really need to look at, well, your QAPP and how that, how that will look effectively. Um, and you really want to set that up. Again, it needs to be set up prior to starting your sampling. But it basically lists out everything. They're about 30 to 40 pages long. Um, they're fairly comprehensive. There is um, uh, co, co signatures from all the organisations involved. So um, whether it be the analytical lab, whether it be the peer reviewers, whether it be your own staff at Ocean Protect, you have all these signatories who have read, reviewed and understand the document and understand exactly what they have to do. Um, you then basically have all your qualifying storms, your reporting and everything else. And probably the key point there is you have conditions in which you'll abandon the site. So you can't just go off a site because you don't like the results. Um, you basically have site abandonment if something, you're getting null outcomes or something's just not exactly working the way it should be. So that's the whole idea with this setup. There's a lot of effort that goes in before you actually set the gear up on site. Brad, do you want to go with this one? Or yeah, one? yeah. Look, obviously, there's a lot of talk about pr testing protocols, and we had a webinar about this key thing uh, mm. that it probably was attended by most of you guys. Uh, won't go into too much detail, but obviously, in the original development of the monitoring pr plan, there was a, a, a number of protocols that uh, were were referred to, and essentially, we need to make sure that we essentially complied with all of them. Um, so, SCUDEP, we've talked about before, is probably a low bar. Uh, so, the, the testing has been developed to comply with that, but also to, to comply with the other protocols, which are more more stringent uh, and probably more scientifically robust. But look, we, I'll skip over the discussions around Squid Up. I think everyone's probably over that. But this is our site uh, out at Western Sydney. Um, it's uh, yeah, just just in the Western Sydney University campus at uh, Kingswood, uh, which is obviously just west of Blacktown. Uh, and look, long story short, it rains, and it's in a it's in a car park. So it's a 420 square meter car park catchment. It's a small tree pit system, uh, and it was installed uh, nearly two and a half years ago. Um, and since then, we've been monitoring it. Uh, it's probably getting a little bit less activity now because of COVID, because no one's going to university. Uh, but that's the system. Uh, that's, the, that's the tree pit system. Behind that, the tree pit system, you can see a shed uh, or a shipping container. There's a whole bunch of fancy monitoring equipment in that. Um, and uh, Michael, you're, you are definitely more best to uh, talk to this. 
<laughs> Thanks, Brad. <laughs> look, um, look on the side, we've set up full uh, upstream, downstream, flow proportional uh, field sampling. So um, effectively, we've picked up a, a sample on or a suction line um, at the inlet to the filter system. Um, and, and then we're obviously picking up the outlet as well. And we've got a couple of flow meters in there worth mentioning. So um, the picture to the far right you can see is an area of velocity meter measuring the total combined flow. Um, and we also, in the, in the middle photo at the top there, have a, have a bubbler uh, flow meter. The bubbler flow module um, is a bit more, I would say, less black box. Um, you can effectively calibrate it um, it's, it's highly accurate, especially with the small flows. Um, you know, you really want those smaller flows coming out of the system to be highly accurate. And with a little V-notch weir, the little bubbler set up, it's accurate to about 2%. So it's quite accurate, especially for those small flows. So you can accurately tell how much is flowing out treated from your system, which is quite crucial. Um, obviously, the rain gauge and the, and the standard 6712 samplers. But... You know, we have complete remote control of the system. So, you know, that enables us to, to look at the latest storm predictions, even a few minutes before a storm, if we have to change either our pacing or our aliquot volumes to get enough coverage and sample, we can. And we can do that immediately up until the storm. So we've got a lot of control by using the right equipment in the right locations. Um, and that's why we get the results one of the reasons why we get the results um, relatively quickly. Yeah, so, and look, it's been reasonably successful. So about 27 storms have been collected over uh, 27 months. So essentially a storm a month. Uh, the treatment flow, flow rates have varied. Uh, as Michael indicated, we have seen flow rates being treated uh, just above five metres an hour. Uh, so certainly above um, our design flow rate. And we're just doing regular maintenance on this. We're not giving it this gold-plated uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, and I'll talk, there's been a few questions already about what we actually do in terms of maintenance, but I'll come to that. So thanks for those questions coming through. And look, long story short, these are the results um, showing the mean influent, effluent, and the uh, efficiency uh, ratio. So, and these are concentration reductions. So this is, and this is looking at all of our qualifying events. So 20 step and storms. So, in summary, 78% uh, TSS uh, concentration reduction, 75% uh, for TP and 42% for, for total nitrogen. And it's worthwhile noting that this is a site actually that does have a fairly high amount of dissolved nitrogen. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not just a heavy particulate nitrogen load off, off this, off the, in the runoff in this site. Um, and dissolved nitrogen, which Michael talked about last week, is far more difficult to achieve removals for than particulate nitrogen. Yeah, probably interesting to note too that whether it be the percentage reductions or, or the effluent quality coming out of the system, um, it's actually quite controlled and quite low. So you look at the effluent quality for solids, phosphorus and nitrogen, it's actually got good controls there. Um, the one issue we've had with the size you can see there is the mean influence for TSS is quite low. This is a car park. In music, you'll model a mean of about 280. So we're, you know, it's like, you know, seven times what we're seeing here, but we're still getting... The, you know, around 80% um, with good control of the airflow. So the system's performing really well, given that the particular portion's relatively low and the dissolved fraction of nutrients is quite high. So I think it's a testament to mm. the system. And it's fairly consistent. Like we've now got a huge data set for Filterra bioretention. If you combine the Australian and, and overseas monitoring, uh, it's a lot of data um, and it's generally consistent across those uh, three sites. Um, but look, what's been really interesting, and, uh, and this is something we've only just started looking at, is how the system is actually performing as it gets older. Um, so when we generally build one of these systems, there's an establishment period of 12 months, and Ocean Protect is still um, you know, uh, uh, essentially owning the system prior to handing over the asset to whoever it might be. If it's, if it's still us, great. But there's obviously a 12-month establishment period, and that's pretty standard for any bioretention system. And if we actually look at the results in the first 12 months and then look at the results in the subsequent period after that first year, after it's been established, uh, what we have actually seen, at least with the data that we have available, is the system does seem to be getting better with age. The system does seem to perform better 
after that first 12 months of establishment period. Uh, and that's really interesting. And it's not just has implications for uh, Filtera bioretention systems, but also potentially conventional bioretention systems. So, and so essentially the system seems to be getting better as it matures. Now, why would that be the case? Now, these are a couple of photos that I took of, our, of um, people might not be familiar. There's, there, there was a wheelie bin experiment. So basically bioretention systems put in wheelie bins at the Logan Home water treatment plant many, many years ago. And this, is, this photo is probably 12 years old. And we actually cut the sides out of these wheelie bins. And you can see, I'm not sure if you can in the, the photo on the right, just how extensive the root rhizome penetration is throughout the filter media. And essentially what I'm trying to explain is what, while we actually don't know why the system is performing better with age, we suspect it's probably due to essentially increased biological activity within the filter media as a result of the vegetation rhizome penetration and, and, and in increased sort of biofilm activity. So that's really interesting. We've got this data. We've got been monitoring this for 27 months. I haven't seen similar data for bioretention, like conventional bioretention systems, but I'd suspect provided these uh, conventional bios are appropriately maintained, which I'm sure happens all the time, uh, probably not. Um, if they're appropriately maintained, we might actually see similar results. But look, with that data, you just some of an opinion, but certainly for Filtera systems, we do seem to be getting a, a greater or improved performance as the system has aged. Yeah, and especially for those nutrient, uh, different types of nutrients as well, so TP and TN, it, um, sure the percentage reductions have increased, but the, the effluent quality is much lower coming out, which sort of supports our hy hypothesis at the moment, um, that, that rhizosphere is doing a lot of work um, in relation to lowering that effluent limit. So yeah, look, time will tell. Um, we might have to stay in the site for a little bit longer oh. just to see where we go. <laughs> yeah, look, long story, <laughs> long story short. <laughs> in conclusion, and we've got a lot of questions coming through. So thanks for everyone who's uh, posting questions. Um, look, long story short, these Filtera or high flow bioretention systems, yeah, they're obviously a lot smaller, uh, but obviously we need to demonstrate their performance. And look, we do have a stack of data now, just for this Western Sydney site alone. We've got 27 uh, qualifying events over just over two years. And after that first year period, uh, after that establishment period, we've, we've got 17 events and we're seeing significant concentration reductions for, for TSS, TP and TN. Um, where to from here? Oh, sorry, I should point out, um, if you're keen for more information, and I'd certainly welcome any invitations to this, I'd, I'm happy to provide you. There's a whole bunch of information in this report, which goes into this study in a lot more detail, but also provides a whole bunch of information in relation to other aspects of Filtera bioretention systems in terms of case studies, approvals, maintenance requirements, et cetera, costs. Um, and I'm happy to provide that report to anyone who wants it. In fact, I could probably just send it out to all the registra registered uh, people. Um, but where to next? If Michael is okay uh, with this, uh, uh, we're going to continue monitoring at this site um, for the foreseeable future. I'm really keen to see how this system performs really in, in the long term. Um, uh, Michael, did you want to talk about the yeah, other side? Yeah, and look, I think we'll probably <laughs> definitely open up the, uh, the flow right here. Um, you, you know, we've, we've, we've seen significant increases in the, in the design, 3,500 millimetres an hour. Um, we know in the States they're, they're approaching 4,500 millimetres an hour. That'll probably be somewhere that we go, I suppose, in the next 12 months with the system because we're clearly we can demonstrate that we're, we're achieving and certainly exceeding those numbers even when the, the media is fully saturated. Um, one of the things that we probably haven't touched on at all is really the volumetric loss. Um, we've seen volumetric losses in Filtera around 5-6%. It's really hard to quantify that in the field because we've got a bit of error. Um, and, you know, your, your systems tend to leak a little bit as well. So we probably need to put that in perspective because all our um, reductions um, through our standards are written uh, load-based, you know, average annual load. So Brad's just been, and we've been talking about today, just about concentration removals. So you could, in theory, add 5 or 6% volume loss onto those to get your load-based reduction. So... Um, we're going to do more work on that in a controlled environment just to really determine what those numbers are. And we've also been developing a, a, a wicking design as well, which we can obviously put a, put a, a wet zone underneath the Filtera base about half a metre deep. And we've developed a wick um, ourselves, ourselves and effectively can get about one and a half metres capillary rise with that wick. So 
we've been um, trialling that in the lab and we've had some success with that at the moment. So we'll probably um, continue on with the testing, but also look more at the volumetric side because that's obviously benefits that typical buyer attention um, obviously has as well. Um, but that's about it, Brad, from me. Yeah, look, uh, and look, we've had a whole bunch of questions uh, come through and I, I think uh, we actually had one prior to the uh, presentation, Michael, so we might actually uh, get that one, uh, we'll look at that one first. And I think that was from Luke. Um, but look, if we don't get a chance to answer your questions uh, today or if there's something else that sort of pops up, um, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Michael. Our contact details are there. Um, and again, that report, if you want it as well, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's there for uh, anyone who wants it and I'll uh, try to provide it to everyone who are registered. Um, but look, I know we've had a heap of questions come through, but first up, did you want to address uh, Luke's question first, Michael? Yeah, sure. Um, you got the question there, Brad? Or? Uh, no, I, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. <laughs> um, so here it is. So, so okay. Luke had a question. Um, how does Filtera compare with the attached core specification? Um, noting that we, we basically have a higher infiltration rate. Look, it's, 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 Filtera is different to anything else that you'll see, um, whether it be from a delivery standpoint, QA perspective, um, you know, how we blend the media. It's totally different to anything I've seen before. I'm not really familiar with the core one. So, um, but we do have a lot of control um, and, it, and it's really key to sort of get, you know, the right, you know, gradation in your media and, and, and have the right amount and, and type of organic material as well sort of within your blend. So, um, yeah, I'm not familiar with the core, but specification, but I know ours is quite tightly controlled. Um, cost of the system, uh, Luke's asked about what about the cost of the system. Look, you know, it's anywhere from $1,000 a square metre through to about $3,000 a square metre for the system. Um, that's designed, supply, installed, maintained um, for 12 months. Um, and that's typical for our for our field terror systems. And that, that's about the questions for Luke. He wanted some additional information because we have TARP approvals and, and things like that, which we can send. So, yeah, because it's been, this system's been around, as Brad said, for 20 years. So there is those approvals which we can send through. Cool. I've just had a, I'll, I'm going to run through, oh, sorry, trying to address one of these, uh, sorry, these questions one at a time. So, uh, and I'll probably do the earlier ones first, if that's okay. Um, a question from Greg Henwood. Uh, Michael, the Warwick farm plants are not plant species that I know of as being suitable for intermittent ponding. Does the high flow rate allow the use of a broader range of plants? The high flow rate probably limits us a little bit with our plant palette, um, given that the filter media may dry out a little bit more, but the mulch layer stops that. Um, what we found though is a lot of the full type of plants that we can use, um, as long as they can tolerate, you know, a slightly drier soil once established, um, we don't tend to have a problem. I think we've tried about 25 different plants at the moment and they all seem to be working quite well. So yeah, it's probably not as broad as what you'd see for, for bioretention, the planting palette, but certainly suitable under the, under the plants we see for fall. There's a question from Andrew Thomas, and look, I think that, sorry, before I, my my two cents would be, yeah, we we generally have a we do have a recommended planning palette in that document that I've referred to just before, um, and we have developed a few locally specific planning palettes as well to suit the requirements of individual councils. Um, so feel free to reach out and get those if you so choose. Um, question from Andrew Thomas, which I pro we probably addressed it towards the end. Do you see the pollutant removal dropping off over time? Yeah, look, we sort of as we talked about before, we're probably uh, think it will actually improve slightly over time. We've certainly seen uh, it improve after that first 12 month period. Um, how it will actually perform over time, say five years down the track, not sure, but we are going to find out. Um, and, but I, I still reckon I'll, we'll see a marginal improvement in pollution removal uh, for the, the TSS, TPs and TNs for sure, because yeah, yeah, of that definitely. increased biological activity and the system essentially becoming more mature and settled. Definitely, and in, in relation to that slide you showed for TPTN, the TP um, influent concentration actually went up, but the effluent quality also um, went down as well, which was great. So that's why the percentage change for, for TP was so high. If we see that a similar situation for TN, because TN was a bit cleaner coming in, a bit lower, we still had that lower effluent quality, which was great. 
you know, because the university shut down at the moment, the, the loads are tending to drop, especially for the solids. So when the university starts back up, as we see the, the loads start to increase again for pollution, um, that'll be really interesting. And that I think that'll probably support what we've been saying is that, you know, the performance will increase actually over time. I don't think there's any doubt of that at the moment. So there's a question from... There's a question from Anthony Healy, um, and there's actually a really common question we've been asked. And one of the things that this Filtera report has is an appendix with our frequently asked questions and responses. And this is a, a classic one we get is, what's the maintenance requirements for Filtera bioretention compared to traditional bioretention? Long story short, uh, they're very similar. Uh, because we had this mulch layer though, uh, we actually go out and actually, well, sorry, we recommend uh, the removal and replacement of that mulch layer approximately every six to 12 months. So that's the key maintenance uh, difference between conventional bioretention and uh, Filtera bioretention system. And look, obviously that is a, a, an increased maintenance burden, but it's also as an insurance policy. It's a safeguard against operational risk and failure. So, and what we're seeing time and time again with a conventional bio is that it is uh, often failing or having operational issues and likely reduced performance function. And a key operational risk is excessive sediment accumulation or blinding of the filter media. We essentially just want to incorporate this mulch layer to essentially appropriately mitigate that risk. Yeah, it might cost a little bit more to maintain but it actually safeguards the, the, the asset in the long term and uh, probably protects its uh, uh, overall treatment performance and function. Yeah, and, and on that, Brad, um, you know, it's, it's and you think about what we're trying to do here, we're, we're, we're removing the solid load, which will block any filter, whether it be a cartridge or bioretention. It'll block that filter and slow that flow rate down. This is probably why we think Filtera, one of the reasons why we think Filtera performance will increase. We're not going to lose the flow rate because we're removing most of those solids through that mulch layer periodically every six to 12 months. Whereas for, uh, for traditional bioretention, you know, the performance may not increase because the system may blind prematurely and may need to rebuild um, a lot quicker than what Filtera is because it's taking much more pollutant load and trying to store it in the biomass. So, you know, easiest way to stop a filter blocking, remove the sediment. You remove the sediment, you keep the saturated hydraulic conductivity up. Cool. There's a other question around how often is the media requiring replacement? There's been a couple of questions around that. Look, we've, we've had systems in the States uh, for about 15 years uh, and they... Uh, Anecdotally, it seemed to be working very fine, very, very well. There's been no performance testing uh, of those systems, but fundamentally their, their function seems to be preserved even after say 15 years. And provided these systems uh, are essentially appropriately maintained, in theory, they should last uh, at least as long as conventional bioretention systems and potentially for, for longer. Michael, do you want to have any further? Yeah, uh, and, and, it's, and it's no surprises. You know, if you sit there and remove the majority of the sediment, once every six months or once every 12 months, you may not never need to rebuild the systems. They may be able to accumulate in their biomass, but um, if you're going to sit there and just put the solids in and, and not maintain it, well, then of course the filter, whatever filter it is, it doesn't matter what brand of filter it is or what type it is, it will block at some stage. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't think it's any surprises why the filter system should last longer than bioretention without a rebuild. Yeah, a question from Christopher Scholes in relation to can we reduce, I guess, the re requirement to remove the, and replace this mulch by, say, having a slightly bigger sediment forebay or a GPT upstream? Uh, or could the, could the mulch be la replaced with an, an organic material uh, like gravel to lower the maintenance cycles? Look, the first question, um, look, look, no. Um, the, the mulch, the, the replacement of the mulch, the function of the sediment in there, um, but also the degradation of that mulch. Remember, you, you're putting organic material in um, and we're very tightly controlled on what, it's just a double shredded hardwood mulch that goes in there, but we don't want any bark or anything like that. We don't want softwood. Uh, why? Because we're going to leach out too many nutrients and will affect the performance. So we go for that hardwood, double shredded, no bark, no leaves. Um, but again, the moisture over time will start to affect that material. So that's, it's partly the sediment, it's partly the moisture as well. So changing out the full bay weight won't affect it. Um, using an inorganic material in lieu of the mulch, look, you know, 
that may be an issue long term for plant health and survivability. You know, we've got this great balance of, you know, we get some nutrient out of the mulch. It, it provides protection layer uh, for the moisture in the soil and also for the solids, but it also provides some nutrient for the plant in addition to the nutrients in the stormwater. Um, we haven't looked at changing that out or, or using something different, and I'm not sure if it would actually work uh, quite well. Look, future area research, you know, we're sort of mm. 78 storms in for Filterra. Um, it's a fairly big data set. We don't have all the answers we'd like to, but we don't. And But look, good question and, and probably something we should look at in the future, I'd say. Mm. Uh, another similar question. Does the, tree, does, the, does the tree ever have to be replaced because of, say, excessive root ball growth? Look, maybe on the smaller systems at some point in time, the, the tree pits that we actually see, um, you know, but these larger basin type systems, you know, I wouldn't expect so. But definitely the smaller systems that may be constrained, yes. Have you got a feel for how often that would need to be done? Look, could be, could, could, look, could be 10 years, could be 15 mm. years, could be something around that, could be around that 10-year period, we think. Mm. Um, but a basin system, you've got, you've got such a large area. So you mm. wouldn't expect it to be in the 10 years. There's a question from Laith. I think it was just actually probably I miscommunicated the, the treatment flow rate because um, the treatment flow rate has varied across the system, but obviously that's dependent on the incoming flow rate. So whilst it might've been say 500 millimeters an hour as a treatment flow rate, that was because essentially less flow was coming into the system. Uh, but certainly the, the system has, has shown to have a capacity to treat water at a smidgen over five meters an hour already. A uh, question from Aditi. Uh, has the has Filtera Bio been shown to remove hydrocarbons at all? We haven't looked at hydrocarbons in our study. Um, that involves glass bottles, different sampling lines, another layer of complexity um, that we haven't gone to as yet. We but could. You'd, we you'd expect, yeah, you could. But you'd expect if you're removing sediment, you'd go a long way to removing hydrocarbons as well. I don't think the question is whether we'll remove it or not. I think we definitely would. We just haven't yeah. studied it as yet. And we're yeah. not, it's not a contaminant we're particularly concerned about at the moment. A question from Rob Booker, Michael. Uh, what, is the, what is the dissolved nitrogen removal pathway in Filterra? Yeah, so look, good question, Rob. Um, look, you've got, as you know, in nitrogen, you've got um, total ketal, um, organic, particulate and soluble nitrogen. Um, you've obviously got ammonium as well, soluble, and you've got nitrite, nitrate um, as well. They're the sort of main pools. Obviously, the particulate, just by physical screening, you, you, you remove that. Um, ammonium and nitrate are the two other big ones. Um, ammonium, just by cation exchange through the media itself. We feel and we believe that the media is getting recharged by a phytoremediation around the rhizosphere of the plant. Um, we believe the work in relation to nitrate is happening between the storms. Um, but yeah, it could, because it's a much more complex process, um, it, the biological activity will take a lot longer than what we're flashing water through at, you know, 3,500 millimetres an hour. We can remove the ammonium straight away. That's it's pretty easy to do, with cation exchange. However, you know, removing that nitrate is far more difficult and that we believe that's happening between the storms. So... I'm conscious of time, but uh, I recognise there's still questions coming through. Um, so, look, apologies if we go a little bit over, over the promised 1.45 p.m. You're welcome to leave us at any stage. Um, there'll be a recording of this available on YouTube in the not-too-distant future. And the, like I said, that document has answers to a whole bunch of frequently asked questions. But I, to, I, I will address uh, each of these questions as best we can. Um, so... Uh, I think we've answered Andrew's already. Ben, um, what happens to flow rate with age and biological maturity? So we've, we think uh, performance is increasing marginally. What about flow rate? Oh, look, flow rate. You know, we haven't seen... That we, we've had our system in at Warwick Farm, the other one, um, for, for almost three years. And we've got a couple of large storms there which washed through a heap of construction sediment, which is obliterated the system we had to replace the mulch but um as the system matures you know you're going to have your different organic material you know getting caught within the media that's going to swell contract it's going to degrade it's going to create pockets um you know and that will give you those preferential pathways through throughout the media so the makeup of the media the materials and pollutants coming in um you you do you do expect the media the flow rate to 
you know, increase to a point over time. Um, what we ha what we know about Filtera is that initially the flow rate's a little bit lower. It does actually pick up in the performance of the system purely by what's coming into it and what's in the media itself. Um, and that's why we, we know that that 3,500 is a fairly conservative figure. Um, another question, Michael, and uh, is from Luke Jones. How much does it cost to have a setup like this and uh, keep uh, doing the monitoring like the, the Western Sydney system? And does Ocean Protect offer these monitoring services for, <laughs> for non uh, Filtera systems? So, Michael, have you got a business on, uh, on the side? Luke, you you're, you're not calling us a competitor, are you, Luke? I hope <laughs> not. Um, <laughs> look, uh, look, it depends who you ask. Um, if you ask someone in the industry, they'll say 100 grand. Um, Look, to, to set up the sites, it's not that much. It's nowhere near that much. Um, you use the right equipment, um, uh, the World Trust equipment. You pay a little bit extra for it when you start, but, but you'd certainly get um, more, more robust equipment and you get better outcomes quicker. Look, you know, sites set up 20, 25, 30,000, $40,000, depending on the complexity. Um, is it something that we offer non filter systems? Sure. As, as long as you're not calling from a competitor, I'm sure we'll be able to help you out. So, um, yeah, not a problem. You know, at the end of the day, we're happy to help people out. Yeah. And um, as long as we share the science and we can all move forward, yeah. I think it's, it's it's a good thing. So, yeah, um, yeah give me a yeah, call, cool. as they say. Uh, Craig uh, Bush has asked about the Gold Coast Lake uh, uh, trial. Um, has it reduced algal growth within the lake or provided any other benefits to the condition of the lake slash pond? Look, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, the the lake is actually in really good quality, uh, even in the absence of the Filtera system. Um, we we have done a little bit of monitoring, uh, and it does uh, it's 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 only preliminary at this stage. But we are looking to extend that monitoring literally in the next uh, starting again in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but look, we're not sure in in sh in short what what the trial was really about was actually just demonstrating whether the system could actually. Uh, work hydraulically and actually to answer more uh, actually Ben Penelaric's original uh, re re recent question you know what ha ha how does the the flow rate change with age we're really keen to see the see that for this system in particular because we are putting so much water through it but look we do do and have done uh, ongoing saturated hydraulic conductivity tests on that Gold Coast Lake example and again it's been the ground for about 18 months and it is holding its flow rate um, it isn't significantly diminishing it isn't increasing, uh, it's basically steady. And again, that system is getting a lot of water. But again, we're gonna continue to monitor that, that system. Um, uh, with regard, this is a question from Hassan. With regards to frequent maintenance, that is every six to 12 months, how, how this frequent maintenance work with plants in the garden? Can you please elaborate on the maintenance? How do you, how do the maintenance, uh, et cetera? Look, there's actually a maintenance guideline. Uh, Hassan, I'll actually probably just, it's, it, look, long story short, it's very similar to a typical bioretention system, except for that uh, additional mulch replacement activity. But look, we do have a, a, a maintenance manual uh, and it provides all the details. So uh, it's probably best if I essentially just flick you that and anyone else who's interested as well. Uh, question from Greg Henwood, how are you removing the mulch? Is it by hand or is it by mechanical equipment? Uh, can a mini excavator traverse over the system, uh, et cetera? <laughs> oh no um look we, we remove it by hand it's in 90 square meter bays a couple of guys can clean a bay out pretty quick actually um it's just really what, what takes the time is the proximity of the basin itself to to where you actually want to tip the mulch but um you know the back of the ute or, or the back of the tipper truck you don't need expensive here if you don't want it so smaller systems yeah a couple of guys in the ute you'll, you'll knock it over pretty quickly so it's just sometimes mechanically we use conveyors if it's a long way um, from the system to, to the tip of truck. But effectively, it's just take that mulch at a 75 mil layer with a sediment in there. It comes up actually very easily once you start the first bit, and then you just slide your shovel under and just scoop. Mm. And just go straight out really easily. And then you're just tipping, tipping the new mulch straight back on. Um, we don't run anything across the top of Filtera. If we did, we'd lower the flow rate because we compact it. So all the voids that we're creating with the system over time to keep that flow rate up, we'd actually diminish that if we're running the equipment over the top. Uh, comment from Andrew, uh, one possible explanation of the improved performance of the system with age is the presence of extracellular enzymes in the soils. I'll take that from the good doctor. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, 
Uh, Stefan Gabbis. Hey, Stefan. Uh, can the old mulch, uh, sorry, can the old mulch be repurposed for other end uses? So uh, we've, we've talked about this previously. They're essentially, the, the mulch can be removed uh, and be used as a soil amendment for landscaping, et cetera. Is that a fair call, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Look, we're, you know, there's so many, so many things we can do with Filterra and looking at the mulch and how that works, whether we run that mulch and sediment through a trommel screen, bit of a spray, and then we send it to green waste to bulk with something else with compost. Look, yeah, we're, we're looking at all that at the moment because, um, you know, one thing's the performance, but then when we change things out, the plant, the media, the mulch load, the different materials which we're looking at, the volumetric losses, and then, yeah, what do you do with the waste at the end of the day? So they're all good things we're looking at to try and, I suppose, improve the sustainability of any bioretention system, not just for terra, but bioretention systems, that, you know, that, that we currently use in Australia. So, yeah, but we've only got two hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to we'd like to do a bit more but um that's certainly an area we thought about and we're looking at at the moment mm. question from sam neil uh does the filter media confirm to the forb specifications uh you look assumingly it doesn't and outperformance but given this uh approval authorities such as councils are otherwise likely to accept the filtera product so I'll, I'll i'll try and answer this as best i can so the report actually provides a comparison between the filter media specs and forb specs and also the crc for water sensitivity specs long story short uh, it complies with everything except uh saturated hydraulic conductivity uh, and the use of a drainage, uh, the use of a drainage layer. Sorry, the use of a transition layer. We don't want to comply with that spec. Um, our key advantage is the fact that this media treats water at a higher flow rate. So subsequently, uh, these systems can be smaller and typically better integrated into otherwise confined spaces, particularly in streetscape environments. Um, so look, uh, and in terms of your other part of your question, in terms of, you know, do councils and other regulatory authorities accept uh, these systems? Man, it is highly variable would be the short answer. Uh, a lot of councils in Queensland, and I can talk to that because I'm in Brisbane, uh, they allow it for public and private use, a private site. So if I just rattle off, so, Bundaberg, Townsville, Cairns, uh, Redlands, uh, I'm sure I'm missing someone, all allowed for public and private sites. Uh, Brisbane allowed for private sites. Sunshine Coast allowed for private sites with a, a few um, limitations. Um, and, in, and in New South Wales, it seems to be reasonably well uh, accepted. I haven't seen any too many dramas. In Victoria, most councils uh, accept it. Um, some councils are saying it has to be endorsed by Melbourne Water and Melbourne Water turn around and say, we don't endorse anything. So that's a bit of a strange situation. But yeah, look, it highly, it's highly variable across Australia would be the short answer. Uh, I'm not sure, Michael, if you want to have anything more to add? Look, yeah, we're in the, the main growth corridors in Sydney. Um, that's obviously where I'm from. So, you know, Wollandilly, Camden, Camden, those ways. Um, we have a conditional approval in Blacktown as well, which is quite impressive. Um, yeah, so certainly people look at the data with Filterra. It is robust. There's no doubt when you start to look in the back end of what we've done, how we set it up. So, yeah, there's plenty of approvals there um, with the technology at the moment, but that will only grow um, yeah, time, I'd say. and it's a really weird space because uh, it's 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 really varies depending on who you talk to whether we're actually a proprietary device or just or just an innovation to bioretention systems. Yeah, and that's so, probably been the difficulty, hasn't yeah. it? Really, mm, it's yeah. like it, you know, we, what what are we? We're we're engineered bioretention media. We have a lot of more tighter controls, and we know exactly how the media is made, what goes in it, and we deliver it as a complete turnkey, like a cartridge filter. But we're not a cartridge filter, so. We're closer to bio, but we get that proprietary sort mm. of put in that box. So it's quite a strange place to be. And that's been, it shouldn't be a hindrance, but I think it has in some aspects for getting the approvals. Yeah. And the biggest, uh, from a consultant's perspective, the biggest drama I seem to encounter is, is that it is like bioretention systems and most, count, most consultants don't believe bioretention systems work. Um, so it's a really weird space uh, for us to be in. Uh, but look, long story short, we've got a stack of data now. Was it 70 plus events over three sites, uh, 27 qualifying events in, in Australia. 
Um, and and the one thing the report talks about is the peer reviews we've un- had undertaken, you know, by Ralph Flyder, Damien McCann, uh, Professor Atar Rahman from the Western City University. Like, this has been extensively critiqued, um, and everyone seems to come to the same conclusion that yeah, the, this is a, a really a, a good solution. Um, but look, don't take my word for it. Um, check out the peer review reports in those in that in that um, document that I referred to. Um, there was a comment actually earlier from Aditi Verma. Um, and it's a fair call. Like traditional biofilters have slower uh, drainage rates that do help, help slow the velocity of stormwater entering our waterways. How does the Filtera system ensure that water quantity is not an issue for our waterways along with the quality? Uh, because obviously urban, stims, urban stream syndrome is not just about uh, quality, it is about water quantity. So frequency and volume of flows. And that's a fair call. Like, we're not looking to replace all bioretention systems um, and certainly bioretention systems in their conventional uh, you know, design and function will all, always probably have their role. Um, we are different. Uh, we are very much focused on water quality, but at the same time, whilst that media does drain quickly, it actually does absorb a lot of uh, flow as well. So we're, Michael, Michael indicated before, we generally see about a five to 6% flow volume reduction. Uh, and whilst water can flow through quickly, it, it, it is uh, slowed down, particularly for those small frequent flow events as well. But look, Michael indicated before, we are looking to essentially uh, enhance on that uh, flow uh, volume and frequency uh, reduction. So we're looking at wicking designs, et cetera. And obviously these systems can be used in conjunction with other devices, such as an underground uh, stormwater harvesting system. And, uh, so yeah, treat water to a high standard, great. But there's no reason why that water can't be appropriately captured and then reused for um, non-potable uh, usages. Um, but certainly we have some very sound data in relation to the performance of these systems, which again, um, there's a lot of talk around flow reductions for, for bioretention systems. And this is something Michael and I have spoken about uh, previously, is that the science is a bit, a bit rubbery. Um, we, we think probably music is actually providing a reasonable prediction of flow reduction. And, and some people are saying, oh yeah, but field monitoring shows that flows are redu- reduced by 30 to 50%. Yeah, it's worthwhile noting that sometimes uh, it's very difficult to measure flow rate and Michael can attest this and often the, the, the monitoring that we see undertaken doesn't actually measure small, small flow rates. So anything less than say 100 millimetres an hour often can be just not measured. So that's why we often see, particularly in the effluent flow measurements, that these flows just aren't there. It's not a case that they aren't, they aren't there, it's just that the flow monitoring equipment used doesn't actually appropriately measure them. Yeah, you can't. It's, it's difficult to measure. Um, that's why we used a V-notch bubbler for our house because it's more accurate with the lower flows because um, we want to see that. And number two, you have leaking systems. Like we, you know, we do cartridge filters, pit baskets, we do a whole range of devices. Um, the amount of times that I've seen chambers, concrete chambers, um, built on-site attention tanks that the cartridge filters that leak, um, you know, so it's not just the volume that you you lose through the system. It's also a lot of leaky wells. So leaky wells and also the measurement of flow is, is certainly an issue. I mentioned this report before. We've obviously gone through a bunch of questions. In this report, there's actually a frequently asked questions uh, section. Uh, so if we didn't get to your question today, uh, there's a big chance that you, um, someone's actually already asked this question and uh, we've provided a response to it. So I'd certainly encourage you to have a look at the questions and responses provided in this document. We've tried to be as transparent as we can uh, and try to answer as honestly and accurately as we can. Uh, but if, if you've got further questions uh, following today, yeah, again, please feel free to uh, reach out to either myself or Michael. Our contact details are on the, on the screen now. Um, but look, without further ado, um, I'd just like to uh, personally thank uh, everyone for attending. We've still got a stack of people uh, or still dialed in. Um, and I certainly thank Michael for his time today. Um, following on from this presentation, like I, I indicated before, we will be providing that report to uh, everyone who registered. Uh, but again, if you've got further questions, feel free to reach out to Michael and myself. Uh, and we will be putting this video and the, the Q&A section on YouTube uh, probably the next couple of weeks as well. So uh, feel free to share it with your friends <laughs> or not. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you very much for your time. We're going to have another, pres- another webinar in a few weeks' time uh, on storm filters and ocean guards. Um, by Harut uh, and uh, Peter Worth from Ocean Protect and uh, look forward to that. And again, uh, thanks so much for everyone's time today and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Well, thanks, Brad. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you.